Picture this, a fighter jet soaring through the skies, a Tesla rolling silently down a highway, and an AI supercomputer crunching through mountains of data. What do all of these have in common? They all depend on tiny, obscure minerals with names most people have never heard of. Things like neodymium, dysprosium, and terbium. These aren't flashy or well-known like gold or silver. They're powders and metals that look ordinary, but without them, the magnets in EV motors wouldn't spin, the sensors in fighter jets wouldn't work, and the chips that power artificial intelligence wouldn't function. They are really the invisible backbone of modern technology. And here's the twist. China controls most of the world's supply. In fact, Beijing has already proven it can use these resources as a geopolitical weapon, tightening exports when tensions rise, loosening them when it wants leverage. It's like having a global on-off switch for the industries of tomorrow. If oil was the black gold that defined the last century, rare earths are the invisible fuel of the 21st century. And right now, they're at the center of a dangerous showdown between the United States and China. To understand why rare earths are now a flashpoint, we need a quick timeline. Back in the 1980s and 1990s, the United States was actually a leader in rare earth production. Mines in California, especially the Mountain Pass mine, supplied much of the world. But then, something happened. China entered the game. Beijing realized early that controlling these materials could shape the future. With cheaper labor, lower environmental standards, and aggressive state subsidies, China ramped up production so massively that U.S. mines couldn't compete. By the early 2000s, America's rare earth industry had all but collapsed. Fast forward to today, China produces over 70% of the world's rare earths and processes, nearly 90% of them. That means even if rare earths are mined somewhere else, say in Australia or the U.S., they usually still have to go to China for refining before they can actually be used in high-tech products. And Beijing hasn't been shy about flexing that power. Back in 2010, during a dispute with Japan, China temporarily cut off rare earth exports. Prices around the world skyrocketed and industries panicked. That was the first real wake-up call that these materials could be weaponized. Now, with U.S.-China tensions at their highest in decades, and Donald Trump back in the White House in 2025, the risk of another export cutoff isn't just theory. It's a real possibility. And the stakes today are far higher because rare earths now touch everything from clean energy to advanced weapon systems. So what exactly makes these minerals so important? Let's break it down in plain terms. Think about electric cars. The powerful magnets inside their motors rely on rare earths like neodymium. Without them, the motors would either be bulkier, less efficient, or flat-out impossible to build at scale. Now look at smartphones and laptops. Every time you swipe, scroll, or make a call, you're depending on rare earth elements hidden inside tiny speakers, screens, and batteries. They keep devices small, light, and fast. Move up to defense technology. Fighter jets like the F-35 use hundreds of kilograms of rare earths in their sensors, targeting systems, and engines. Missiles night vision goggles, and even submarines. All of them need these minerals to work. Without rare earths, modern militaries would be fighting blind. And then there's renewable energy. Wind turbines need massive magnets made with rare earths to generate electricity. Solar panels also use them in production. In other words, the clean energy revolution depends on the very materials that one country, China, has under its thumb. To put it simply, rare earths are the hidden wiring inside the global economy. You don't see them, but if they disappeared tomorrow, everything from TikTok on your phone to America's fighter jets in the Pacific would feel the shock. Now here's the twist. China doesn't need to ban rare earth exports outright to wield power. Instead, it built a system of licensing and approvals that works like a valve. They can open it for friends and tighten it for rivals. Here's how it works in practice. Licenses. Any company that wants to ship rare earths abroad has to apply for an export license. It's not automatic. Beijing can slow walk or deny these applications at will. End use verification. Importers must show proof of what the minerals will be used for. If it's a partner country using them for civilian EVs, the approval might come quickly. If it's the United States requesting materials that might end up in fighter jets, suddenly that paperwork takes months or never gets approved. Preferential treatment. China has also broadened the scope of what's controlled. It started with gallium, germanium, and graphite. Now, seven categories of rare earths are under the same system. At the same time, exporters to friendly states get a fast track. 
It's basically a two-lane highway, allies in the express lane, rivals stuck in gridlock. This policy is powerful because it doesn't look like an embargo. On paper, the rules seem technical, even bureaucratic. But in reality, it's a choke point that gives China leverage over who gets the building blocks of modern technology and who doesn't. Then the restrictions hit. Between March and May, United States imports of rare earths from China collapsed by more than 75%. That's not a gradual slowdown. That's like turning a fire hose into a dripping faucet overnight. The shock showed up fast and the industry's most exposed defense contractors had to rethink timelines for jet fighters and missile systems that depend on rare earth-based sensors and actuators. EV manufacturers faced higher costs and delivery delays because their motors couldn't be swapped out with off-the-shelf alternatives. High-end manufacturers, from fiber optics to precision robotics, suddenly had to recalculate months of supply planning. This wasn't just about dollars lost, it was about time. Programs that rely on continuity, like assembling an F-35 or rolling out an EV line, don't work when you miss even a few shipments. And in a world where development cycles are counted in weeks, not years, that kind of break is crippling. For Washington, the message was crystal clear. When China moves, America feels it. Instantly. Suddenly couldn't get its usual supply straight from China. Something strange happened in the trade data. Imports of certain minerals like antimony oxide started pouring in from unlikely places, Thailand and Mexico. Here's the catch. Neither of those countries has the mines or factories to produce that much. Yet between December and April, the United States imported about 3,834 tons of antimony oxide from them, almost the same amount it had imported in the previous three years combined. So what was going on? The most likely explanation, transshipment. Chinese materials were being rerouted through third countries, relabeled, and then shipped on to the United States. It's like changing the jersey on a player and pretending it's a new team. On paper, the shipment looked Thai or Mexican. In reality, the conveyor belt still started in China. This workaround bought the United States some breathing room, but it came with risks. Transshipment is easy to detect, and once Beijing spots the pattern, it can tighten controls even further. It's a bit like trying to sneak water through a leaky pipe while the plumber is standing right there watching. By May, China publicly warned that it was tightening oversight. Officials promised not only to crack down on exporters gaming the system, but also to punish the transit hubs helping the workaround. What might that look like? Well, three levers are on the table stricter export checks, making licenses even harder to get, with more proof demanded at every stage. Blacklisting transshipment partners. If a country becomes known for laundering exports, China can simply cut it off entirely. And economic penalties, such as sanctions or curbs on other industries in those same countries. The message was sharp. You can't hide a conveyor belt. If China doesn't want its resources ending up in US fighter jets, then even creative paperwork won't protect the middlemen. This marked a turning point. The workaround wasn't sustainable. By mid-June, both Washington and Beijing realized the stalemate couldn't hold. Factories in the U.S. needed magnets and oxides. China, meanwhile, was facing its own bottleneck high-performance AI chips. Here's why those chips matter. Training a cutting-edge AI model isn't like running an app on your phone. It's like powering a small city. You need specialized processors like NVIDIA's H100 accelerators to crunch the data. Without them, China's ambitions in AI, autonomous weapons, and advanced research stall. So the two sides tested a trade-off. China signaled it could resume some rare earth exports for civilian industries if the U.S. loosened restrictions on certain high-end chips, in other words, magnets for Teslas, in exchange for processors to train large AI systems. For a brief window, the deal looked possible. Shipments ticked back up, signaling that both sides were at least willing to experiment with compromise. It wasn't a full solution, but it was a reminder. Each holds something the other can't easily replace. The question was, how long could that fragile bargain last? Then came a data point that grabbed everyone's attention. In June, U.S. imports of rare earths from China jumped by 660%, hitting 353 tons. Now, on paper, that's not a huge number. It's a few rail cars worth of material, barely a dent in overall demand. But the symbolism was enormous. Think of it this way. 353 tons of processed rare earths can be roughly converted into the magnets for hundreds of fighter jet components or hundreds of thousands of EV motors. 
That's enough to restart key production lines, at least temporarily. But the bigger story wasn't the wait. It was the signal. This surge showed that channels could reopen, if politics allowed it. It was like a trial balloon, China saying we'll send some, but only if the deal holds. For the U.S., it was a taste of relief. For China, it was a reminder of leverage. And for both, it was proof that this wasn't just about minerals. It was about trust and how fragile that trust had become. Just when it looked like things were stabilizing, Washington added a new demand, and it landed like a bomb on the negotiation table. The United States proposed a clause that would effectively ban China from buying oil from Russia and Iran. On top of that, it threatened secondary tariffs of up to 100% on Chinese goods if Beijing didn't comply. For Beijing, this move felt less like a trade negotiation and more like a trap. Rare earths and semiconductors were one thing. They were directly tied to technology. But suddenly dragging in energy policy meant Washington was linking unrelated issues just to apply pressure. It was a classic escalation tactic. Use one deal to force leverage in another arena, but it came at a cost. What had looked like a cautious opening toward compromise now felt like betrayal, a backstab that shattered trust. So why did Washington throw oil into the rare earth talks? For Beijing, the U.S. oil clause wasn't just aggressive, it was unrealistic. China has already locked itself into long-term energy deals that it cannot and will not walk away from. Take Iran. In 2021, China signed a 25-year cooperation plan worth up to $400 billion. The deal covers energy, infrastructure, and security, but at its heart, it guarantees a steady flow of discounted Iranian oil. That's a strategic lifeline, not a short-term purchase. Then there's Russia. China agreed to buy about 45 million tons of oil annually under another 25-year deal, valued at roughly $270 billion. These contracts aren't handshakes. They're hard commitments, written into Beijing's long-term energy security strategy. Walking away would not only blow up trust with Moscow and Tehran, but also undermine China's entire approach to diversifying energy supplies away from U.S. influence. From Beijing's perspective, giving up those pipelines and tankers in exchange for a few hundred tons of rare earth exports from Washington's deal was a bad trade. This is where the game theory comes in. The U.S. was betting that short-term pressure would force concessions. But China is playing the long game. And when energy security is on the line, Beijing won't fold. So what does all of this add up to? The rare earth fight, the oil clause, the chip for magnets bargaining, they're not just isolated battles. They reveal a new reality. The future of geopolitics is about controlling inputs, not just outputs. In the 20th century, power was measured in factories, armies, and markets. In the 21st century, it's measured in who controls the building blocks, the minerals that power electric vehicles the chips that fuel artificial intelligence, and the energy that keeps economies running. If the U.S. keeps escalating with tariffs and sanctions, China's leverage in rare earths only becomes sharper. If China keeps restricting exports, American and European industries scramble. The likely outcome isn't a clean win for either side. It's a messy stalemate where supply chains fragment, costs rise, and companies rush to stockpile whatever they can get. And here's why this matters to you. The rare earths in a fighter jet are also in your smartphone. The oil Beijing buys from Russia shapes the gas prices you see at the pump. These are not distant struggles. They're battles that ripple into daily life. The bottom line, resource diplomacy is the new front line. It's about who gets to turn the tap on and who has to live with it turned off. So let me ask you, if you had to bet, do you think Washington's pressure campaign will force a breakthrough or will Beijing's patience win out? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you want to keep tracking how this power struggle plays out, from rare earths to chips to oil, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. Because the next phase of this story, it's only just beginning.